Section 4 of Whirly Gigs by O. Henry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Calloway's Code. The New York Enterprise sent H. B. Calloway as special correspondent to the Russo Japanese Portsmouth War. For two months, Calloway hung about Yokohama and Tokyo, shaking dice with the other correspondents for drinks or rickshaws. Oh, no. That's something to ride in. Anyhow, he wasn't earning the salary that his paper was paying him. But that was not Calloway's fault. The little brown men who held the strings of fate between their fingers were not ready for the readers of the Enterprise to season their breakfast bacon and eggs with the battles of the descendants of the gods. But soon the column of correspondents that were to go out with the First Army tightened their field glass belts and went down to the Yalu with Kuroki. Calloway was one of these. Now, this is no history of the Battle of the Yalu River. That has been told in detail by the correspondents who gazed at the shrapnel smoke rings from a distance of three miles. But for justice' sake, let it be understood that the Japanese commander prohibited a nearer view. Calloway's feat was accomplished before the battle. What he did was to furnish the Enterprise with the biggest beat of the war. That paper published exclusively and in detail the news of the attack on the lines of the Russian general on the same day that it was made. No other paper printed a word about it for two days afterward, except the London paper, whose account was absolutely incorrect and untrue. Calloway did this in face of the fact that General Kuroki was making his moves and laying his plans with the profoundest secrecy as far as the world outside his camps was concerned. The correspondents were forbidden to send out any news whatever of his plans, and every message that was allowed on the wires was censored with rigid severity. The correspondent for the London paper handed in a cablegram describing Kuroki's plans, but as it was wrong from the beginning to end, the censor grinned and let it go through. So there they were, Kuroki on one side of the Yalu, with 42,000 infantry, 5,000 cavalry, and 124 guns. On the other side, Sasulich waited for him, with only 23,000 men, and with a long stretch of river to guard. And Calloway had got hold of some important inside information that he knew would bring the Enterprise staff around a cablegram as thick as flies around a Park Row lemonade stand. If he could only get that message past the censor, the new censor who had arrived and taken his post that day. Calloway did the obviously proper thing. He lit his pipe and sat down on a gun carriage to think it over. And there we must leave him, for the rest of the story belongs to Vessie, a sixteen-dollar-a-week reporter on the Enterprise. Calloway's cablegram was handed to the managing editor at four o'clock in the afternoon. He read it three times, and then drew a pocket mirror from a pigeonhole in his desk, and looked at his reflection carefully. Then he went over to the desk of Boyd, his assistant. He usually called Boyd when he wanted him, and laid the cablegram before him. It's from Calloway, he said. See what you make of it. The message was dated at Weeju, and these were the words of it. Foregone, preconcerted rash, witching goes muffled, rumor, mind, dark, silent, unfortunate Richmond existing, great hotly brute select, mooted, powerless beggars, ye angels incontrovertible. Boyd read it twice. It's either a cipher or a sunstroke, said he. Ever hear of anything like a code in the office, a secret code? asked the M.E., who had held his desk for only two years. Managing editors come and go. None except the vernacular that the ladies' specials write in, said Boyd. Couldn't be an acrostic, could it? I thought of that, said the M.E., but the beginning letters contain only four vowels. It must be a code of some sort. Try them in groups, suggested Boyd. Let me see. Rash witching goes. Not with me, it doesn't. Muffled rumor mine. Must have an underground wire. Dark, silent, unfortunate Richmond. No reason why he should knock that town so hard. 
existing great hotly. No, it doesn't pan out. I'll call Scott. The city editor came in a hurry and tried his luck. A city editor must know something about everything. So Scott knew a little about cipher writing. It may be what is called an inverted alphabet cipher, said he. I'll try that. R seems to be the oftenest used initial letter, with the exception of M. Assuming R to mean E, the most frequently used vowel, we transpose the letters so. Scott worked rapidly with his pencil for two minutes and then showed the first word according to his reading. The word subjects. Great, cried Boyd. It's a charade. My first is a Russian general. Go on, Scott. No, that won't work, said the city editor. It's undoubtedly a code. It's impossible to read it without the key. Has the office ever used a cipher code? Just what I was asking, said the M.E. Hustle everybody up. That ought to know. We must get at it some way. Calloway has evidently got hold of something big, and the censor has put his screws on, or he wouldn't have cabled in a lot of chop suey like this. Throughout the office of the Enterprise, a dragnet was sent, hauling in such members of the staff as would be likely to know of a code, past or present, by reason of their wisdom, information, natural intelligence, or length of servitude. They got together in a group in the city room, with the M.E. in the center. No one had heard of a code. All began to explain to the head investigator that newspapers never use a code, anyhow. That is, a cipher code. Of course, the associated press stuff is a sort of code, an abbreviation, rather, but... The M.E. knew all that and said so. He asked each man how long he had worked on the paper. Not one of them had drawn pay from an enterprise envelope for longer than six years. Calloway had been on the paper twelve years. Try old Heffelbauer, said the M.E. He was here when Park Row was a potato patch. Heffelbauer was an institution. He was half janitor, half handyman about the office, and half watchman, thus becoming the peer of thirteen and one half tailors. Sent for... He came, radiating his nationality. Heffelbauer, said the M.E., did you ever hear of a code belonging to the office a long time ago, a private code? You know what a code is, don't you? Yeah, said Heffelbauer, sure I know what code is. Yet about twelve or fifteen years ago, their office had a code. The reporters in the city room have it here. Ah, said the M.E., we're getting on the trail now. Where was it kept, Heffelbauer? What do you know about it? Sometimes, said the retainer, they keep it in the little room behind the library room. Can you find it? asked the Emmy eagerly. Do you know where it is? Mein Gott, said Heffelbauer. How long do you think the goat live? The reporters call him a mascot, but one day he butt his head against the editor and... Oh, he's talking about a goat, said Boyd. Get out, Heffelbauer. Again discomfited, the concerted wit and resource of the Enterprise huddled around Calloway's puzzle, considering its mysterious words in vain. Then Fessy came in. Fessy was the youngest reporter. He had a 32-inch chest and wore a number 14 collar, but his bright scotch plaid suit gave him presence and conferred no obscurity upon his whereabouts. He wore his hat in such a position that people followed him about to see him take it off, convinced that it must be hung upon a peg driven into the back of his head. He was never without an immense knotted hardwood cane with a German silver tip on its crooked handle. Bessie was the best photograph hustler in the office. Scott said it was because no living human being could resist the personal triumph it was to hand his picture over to Bessie. Bessie always wrote his own news stories, except the big ones, which were sent to the rewrite men. Add to this fact that among all the inhabitants, temples, and grooves of the earth, nothing existed that could abash Vesey, and his dim sketch is concluded. Vesey butted into the circle of cipher readers, very much as Heffelbauer's code would have done, and asked what was up. Someone explained, with a touch of half-familiar condescension, that they always used toward him. 
Bessie reached out and took the cablegram from the M.E.'s hand. Under the protection of some special providence, he was always doing appalling things like that and coming off unscathed. It's a code, said Vessie. Anybody got the key? The office has no code, said Boyd, reaching for the message. Vessie held to it. Then old Calloway expects us to read it anyhow, said he. He's up a tree or something, and he's made this up so as to get it by the censors. It's up to us, gee. I wish they had sent me, too. Say, we can't afford to fall down on our end of it. Foregone, preconcerted, rash, witching. Hmm. Bessie sat down on a table corner and began to whistle softly, frowning at the cablegram. Let me have it, please, said the M.E. We've got to get to work on it. I believe I've got a line on it, said Bessie. Give me ten minutes. He walked to his desk, threw his hat in a waste paper basket, spread out flat on his chest, like a gorgeous lizard, and started his pencil going. The wit and wisdom of the Enterprise remained in a loose group and smiled at one another, nodding their heads toward Vessie. Then they began to exchange their theories about the cipher. It took Vessie exactly fifteen minutes. He brought to the M.E. a pad with the code key written on it. I felt the swing of it as soon as I saw it, said Vessie. Hurrah for old Calloway! He's done the Japs in every paper in town that prints literature instead of news. Take a look at that. Thus said Vessie, set forth the reading of the code. Foregone conclusion, preconcerted, arrangement rash. Act witching, hour of midnight. Goes without saying, muffled report. Rumor hath it, mine host, dark horse, silent majority. Unfortunate pedestrians, rich men. In the field existing, conditions, great white way, hotly contested, brute force select, few mooted, question parlous times, beggars description, ye correspondent angel, unawares, incontrovertible fact. Mr. Vesey afterward explained that the logical journalistic complement of the word unfortunate was once the word victim. But since the automobile became so popular, the correct following word is now pedestrians. Of course, in Calloway's code, it meant infantry. It's simply newspaper English, explained Vessie. I've been reporting on the Enterprise long enough to know it by heart. Old Calloway gives us the Q word, and we use the word that naturally follows it, just as we use them in the paper. Read it over, and you'll see how pat they drop into their places. Now here's the message he intended us to get. Bessie handed out another sheet of paper. Concluded arrangements to act at hour of midnight without saying. Report hath it that a large body of cavalry and an overwhelming force of infantry will be thrown into the field. Conditions white. Way contested by only a small force. Question the time's description. Its correspondent is unaware of the facts. Great stuff, cried Boyd excitedly. Kuroki crosses the Yalu tonight and attacks. Oh, we won't do a thing to the sheets that make up with Addison's essays, real estate transfers, and bowling scores. Mr. Vesey, said the M.E., with his jollying, which you should regard as a favor manner, you have cast a serious reflection upon the literary standards of the paper that employs you. You have also assisted materially and giving us the biggest beat of the year. I will let you know in a day or two whether you are to be discharged or retained at a larger salary. Somebody sent Ames to me. Ames was the kingpin. The snowy, petaled Marguerite, the star-bright Lolu of the rewrite men. He saw attempted murder in the panes of green apple colic, cyclones in the summery zephyr, lost children in every top-spinning urchin, an uprising of the downtrodden masses in every hurling of a derelict potato at a passing automobile. When not rewriting, Ames sat on the porch of his Brooklyn villa, playing checkers with his ten-year-old son. Ames and the war editor shut themselves in a room. There was a map in there, stuck full of little pins, that represented armies and divisions. Their fingers had been itching for days to move those pins 
along the crooked line of the Yalu. They did so now, and in the words of fire, Ames translated Calloway's brief message into a front-page masterpiece that set the world talking. He told of the secret councils of the Japanese officers, gave Kuroki's flaming speeches in full, counted the cavalry and infantry to a man and a horse, described the quick and silent building of the bridge at Tsukichen, across which the Mikado's legions were hurled upon the surprised Sasulich, whose troops were widely scattered along the river. And the battle? Well, you know what Ames can do with a battle if you give him just one smell of smoke for a foundation. And in the same story, with seemingly supernatural knowledge, he gleefully scored the most profound and ponderous paper in England for the false and misleading account of the intended movements of the Japanese First Army printed in its issue of the same date. Only one error was made, and that was the fault of the cable operator at Weiju. Calloway pointed it out after he came back. The word great in his code should have been gauge, and its complemental word of battle. But it went to Ames's condition white, and of course he took that to mean snow. His description of the Japanese army struggling through the snowstorm, blinded by the whirling flakes, was thrillingly vivid. The artists turned out some effective illustrations that made a hit as pictures of the artillery dragging their guns through the drifts. But as the attack was made on the 1st of May, conditions white excited some amusement, but it made no difference to the enterprise anyway. It was wonderful, and Calloway was wonderful, and having made the new censor believe that his jargon of words meant no more than a complaint of the dearth of news and a petition for more expense money. And Vessie was wonderful, and most wonderful of all are words, and how they make their friends with one another, being oft associated until not even obituary notices them do part. On the second day following, the city editor halted at Vessie's desk, where the reporter was writing the story of a man who had broken his leg by falling into a coal hole, Ames having failed to find a murder motive in it. "'The old man says your salary is to be raised to twenty a week,' said Scott. "'All right,' said Vessie. "'Every little helps. "'Say, Mr. Scott, which would you say? "'We can state without fear of successful contradiction, "'or, on the whole, it can be safely asserted.'" End of Callaway's Code.